Um, um, and I thought I'd change my format. I, uh, when I started writing this talk uh, in the airport yesterday, I didn't have access to the internet, so I couldn't find out what I had told you I was going to say. Uh, and I remember it was only about a historical introduction, but I decided that would probably, you know, I don't know. I've tried talking to real people. Like, I have to tell you instantly, I'm rather nervous talking before a conference like this because I think you guys actually know something. We guys who are above the fray, you know, and looking at the ebb and flow of events and so forth, I'm not convinced we know anything. But whatever it is I don't know, I'm going to tell it to you. So let me start out with a few, you know, for a large scope. I believe, as some, I know other people believe, that the root problems in this field are social and economic, which is a long way from having any real understanding of what they are or what one might do about them. Um, but I think I do understand why there are great problems. Because the human species is engaged in doing something two things, two interrelated things, that we haven't done in thousands of years. The first one is we are moving our civilization into computer-mediated channels. I find no analogy for that any more recently than moving into cities. In short, before we lived in cities, we lived in a natural environment over which we had minimal control. Once we moved into cities, we found ourselves in an environment where lots of the things going on were the results of human decisions. You walked on pavements laid down by people. You gathered in meeting places that had been arranged for that purpose. And you get a whole mechanism. Notice how many words, at least in English, forgive me, uh, use the Greek root polis, the city policy, police, metropolis itself. Uh, the mechanism of the city rose to become a dominant element in human society. And I would maintain we are doing the same thing now. We're taking our cultural machinery and we're moving it into the internet. But this is accompanied by another thing that's no less dramatic in time scale. We are, have discovered the greatest manufacturing material in at least a couple of thousand years. Software is the most wonderful thing to build things out of. You need a very small base of something to run it, and then you can produce immensely elaborate functions. So I'd maintain in a very real sense, we are as much moving into a software age as we moved into an iron age two, three thousand years ago. Now, given that view of the internet, the fundamental security problem is it isn't at all like any of the networks that have been secured in the past. Basically, if you look at the things that people look to, and it, this is in part because the whole field is infected with the early people who thought about it, namely the military. Right? But if you think about military communication networks, military command and control networks, these networks are meant for friends to talk to friends. And typically, they have a very limited set of authorities and a very clear understanding of where authority lies. The internet has none of that. It's meant to everybody, it meant for everybody to talk to everybody. And its size is not in the millions of nodes. It's not in the, you know, 18, 20,000 kilometers across the earth. It is in the diversity of authority, in the nearly 200 countries, in the millions of corporations and the billions of individuals in the incredible diversity of objectives. And that is what I think calls into question. You say, of course you're going to look at these networks and say they're not secure. It's because we took our notion of security from a very different set of things and it's not clear that that's either what we need or what we can have, what we want, etc. 
So I, I draw a conclusion I haven't heard anybody else draw, and maybe somebody else thinks it, which is that a secure Internet could not serve our needs. I have heard people say things like that, you know, if we had to do over again, Leonard Kleinrock said this in the meeting of the Marconi Fellows about five years ago, Columbia. Well, if we had the Internet to do over again, we would build in strong authentication from the beginning. I, I don't actually think that could have been done, but the critical point is that if it had, the Internet would have become what Paul Barron and some other people originally envisioned, a national, you know, critical infrastructure command and control network, uh, it would not have become the incredible economic and cultural force that it has become. The critical thing about all of this is the very loose coupling that allows things to grow up independent of other things and have status by the time they meet those other things. I think there's a certain analogy in what I'm imagining with the unreliability of the Internet Protocol. That is one of the greatest discoveries ever in communications. How do we get communications that are in essentially every respect better? In, in fact, at the top, by the time you get to the top, overall more reliable. We depend on a layer that says, you know, yeah, I'll get it there if I can. And similarly, I'm not suggesting that you can't do secure things within the Internet. But I'm suggesting that the Internet itself can in no more meaningful sense be secure than maybe, you know, than the oceans are secure. There are security activities in the oceans. There is law of the sea. There are many aspects of it. But the functioning of humanity has depended on the openness and diversity of the seas. And I think it depends similarly on the openness and diversity of the Internet with the incredible difference, of course, that we didn't, we didn't build the seas and we are building the Internet. Finally, I have an intuition I can do nothing about proving. People are constantly saying, you know, well, we will always have crime or something like that. And I don't know why that is. I stumble on the answer that I think we will always need crime. And I can't exactly prove that, but I'm pretty convinced that if crime weren't serving the interests of a vast part of humanity, it would have been stomped out. Right? And similarly, I think I draw the conclusion that the Internet needs crime. Now let me go back to an historical view of this, because I want to talk about two things. I'll get back to back to the current situation after a while. But I like talking about cryptography and I think people invite me to talk because I'm a cryptographer and maybe they like hearing about cryptography. So, you know, there was InfoSec before the 20th century. I don't think they had that particular piece of jargon, but uh, 1890s, they knew how to, you know, beginning to learn how to label documents. That's moderately new thing, mass scale distribution of restricted documents, like those slides we just saw. Um, they, uh, you know, they knew how to lock their safes and guard their buildings and things like that. And the most amazing thing happened in January of 1904. Marconi managed the first transatlantic radio transmission, and that just changed everything. First place, in and of itself, it changed everything. Radio, it was just, you know, the most wonderful thing. Right? You really couldn't expect to win wars or stay in business or anything else if you ignored it. And the clearest way to see that is to look at the British Navy. Circa, well, before radio and up till 1905, 6, 7, 8, the first Sea Lord commanded the greatest fleet in the world and had very little idea where it was. They had a big table down at the Admiralty. They had a wrap of the world on the table. They had a lot of little toy boats. They had a bunch of schnooker cues, right? And whenever they got some information, they'd move boats and update their estimate of where the fleet was. 
within about five years of the introduction of radio into the British Navy, you could reach any ship in a day or so. And of course, that contracted rather quickly, you know, to hours, to minutes, to seconds. And now, with the single exception of submarines, it's essentially the same thing as picking up the phone and calling anybody else. Now, that wove the British Navy together into a, into a military and diplomatic implement vastly superior to what it had been before. But it has this charming drawback. Right? You've created this nervous system and put it up in the air where everybody can see it. The drawback from a security point of view of radio is that everybody can listen to the radio. And very frequently, your opponents are getting better reception than you are. And uh, this is disquieting to the folks. Um, well, you all know, um, you know essentially what happened. Come the First World War, there's only now, for a vast range of the communications, there is only one technique known. Uh, one of the security me none of the security measures I mentioned before applies. There's only one thing known, and it goes back, uh, it has two origins that, that are known origins. The first played no role, as far as we know. That is, Bas under the Caliphate al-Kindi, uh, about 200 after the years after the Hajara, knew, knew the same things that were discovered uh, in, in Italy about 1500 by Alberti and Porta and others, and you, you find the roots of modern cryptography in those places, and almost all the current notions are recognizable there. Incidentally, the major things in computer science terms are table lookups, sometimes in tables as small as what's called a cipher alphabet, we look up one letter and you get another one, sometimes in tables as large as what are called codes, in which you have hundreds of thousands of elements. And the other thing you have is some kind of arithmetic. Right? And it, for a long time, uh, arithmetic modulo the alphabet size was very popular, and now we've managed to get up as far as mathematics of the 19th century, and we use Galois field operations. But in essence, cryptographic operations consist of index a table, look it up in a table, index a table, look it up in a table, combined and iterated uh, ad nauseum. Well, World War I brought radio to the fore. The code clerks were overloaded. There's a charming story for which I can't find an authentic source, but it doesn't seem surprising, which is that toward the end of World War I, if you wanted to send a message from Washington to the expeditionary force in Paris, well, it was an unclassified message. It went immediately. If it was a secret message, well, it, it got hung up in the queues, a couple of days waiting to be encrypted at one end, a couple of days waiting to be decrypted at the other end. These crypto systems, incidentally, uh, were very slow. They could sort of, you know, process a few words a minute. But that's nah, all right. They weren't very secure either. Um, the response to that was automation. You know, this, I said that the theory was set down in the Western world circa 1500. And the trouble is, it leads to something I won't go through of all of this, particularly without slides, but a system called polyalphabetic cipher is the best known, it's called multiple loop visionaire. Uh, and the difficulty is you could specify quite a secure crypto system of this kind. It's just that nobody can do it by hand. You're going to make too many errors. You never get any messages through. It waited until you had mechanical or electromechanical computing, albeit of a sort of restricted form, before you could do this. So in the year 1915 to 1920, we get at least three discoveries of what becomes the dominant mechanical cryptographic system of the next roughly 40 or 50 years. Uh, the earliest, though not the most solidly established, is, is Dutch. Uh, it uh, was discovered by Carl de Leo, who's an historian of, uh, of science. Uh, I think he may be at Eindhoven, but I, that doesn't sound right. It's not far from here, but I don't think he's in Amsterdam itself. Um, and 
found this discovery in the Dutch Navy in the East Indies about 1915. The other two, that, the others that are better known, Heber, the solidist, because it manifests as a patent in 1918, is by Hebron in Oakland, California. And then Dam Koch and Sherbius uh, laid down the foundations that led to the commercial and ultimately military enigmas, one of the most successful, in some senses, uh, cryptographic design ever. World War II produced a different sort of revolution. It would be fun to talk about it in detail, but there isn't time. The, but that is the point of transition from electromechanical devices to electronic devices. Basically, you know, rotor machines, one, they're rather slow. You want to try to encrypt voice, you're in real trouble. You know, you can do about 10 characters, 100 bits a second, whereas voice needed a minimum of about 2,400. Uh, and Second, you have all sorts of expense of manufacturing the rotors and guarding the rotors and keeping the rotors secret and so forth. And it was discovered as a function of the rise of, you know, learning about computer arithmetic that you can really get a lot more action out of a small number of, uh, of flip-flops and a shift register than you can out of rotors. And rotors gradually fell out of popularity. Um, I mean, that's a funny thing for me to say. I happen to be also working for a company that's hawking a new rotor machine, but, you know, what goes around comes around. Um, so where does this led us? Well, oh, psst, I should say a slight word. 1970s produced the first thing that got us away from the mathematics that have been around for 500 years. I'd say. And the reason I'm talking to you today is because several of us in the 1970s developed what is called public key cryptography, a cryptograph set of cryptographic systems that are asymmetric, that allow us to negotiate secure communications without ever having had any prior contact, in particular, without having shared secrets ahead of time. And that is, in one sense, indispensable to all modern network security. In another sense, I think you could say with some legitimacy that public key took cryptography from a non-starter to an also ran in network security. And I'll try to say one or two more other little bits about that as they go on. Well, what's the current status? The current status of cryptographic algorithms is very good. For a long time, people were very nervous because in World War II, quite a number of systems that were highly trusted by the people who used them were broken. Um, and a general nervousness about cryptography took hold. But if you look at the Cold War history of cryptography, you find that in NATO, for example, a rotor machine called the KL-7 was introduced in the early 50s, wasn't retired until the early 80s. Uh, early electronic systems called the KW7, I think, has, has, a, has a little bit later, has a, has a sort of a similar, you see a 30-year lifetime. In the data encryption standard that was adopted in the U.S. in 1977 and finally dropped, I don't know, 2002 or something, you see a 30-year lifetime. See, multi-decade lifetimes uh, of systems that seem not to have been broken over quite a long period of time. So an historical argument would tend to give you faith in this. And now we get to a situation where uh, the U.S. did a, a wonderful and surprising thing beginning in two th 1997, concluding in 2001. It held a big conference to select a successor to its data encryption standard and selected a Belgian system, a Belgian design system uh, for that purpose. It's called, uh, un-euphoniously, the Advanced Encryption Standard. This was augmented by what I call second generation public key cryptography, which was discovered in the, in the mid 80s and uh, had been worked on by quite a variety of people. And altogether, this was bundled up in 2005 to give you a, a US centric view. It was bundled up by the National Security Agency as what is called Suite B, Suite A referring to some bunch of secret algorithms they liked before that. And they declared that the suite B suite of algorithms correctly implemented were going to be regarded as adequate for all levels of classified traffic. They did that for two interesting reasons. And it's not for their love of openness. 
um, this of uh, something of which I doubt they have much been accused. Um, it is because one, right, the modern notion of sort of, you know, coalition forces fighting wars. I mean, it's not too much exaggeration to say we like to go out and get drunk in a bar on Saturday night and pick up a few partners and go fight a war on Monday morning. Second, well, the vast production of electronic equipment is commercial. If you could get the security of commercial equipment up to where the military found it adequate, then they could buy it a lot cheaper. So those two, those two things motivated them to give up fighting against other people having cryptography and establish a, uh, a set of standards. So that time period from 1915, the first enigma uh, in Dutch, Dutch Navy in the East Indies, to 2005 is 90 years. Algorithms are in good shape, but everything else isn't. So, you know, what, why are crypto algorithms in good shape? Well, as I say, we've been working on them for 90 years. Important point, we'll get back to it in a second. Um, but I'm pretty convinced if cryptography hasn't saved the world the way I and some other people thought it would only 40 years ago, um, it is not because the algorithms aren't good. I mean, I'll give you a brief aside, because it occurs to me, you know, there's, there's, me and Spett will know, there's what are called, a family of cryptographic systems that have been popular off and on, called one-time systems. You manufacture random numbers by throwing dice or watching radioactive sources or whatever you like to do, uh, and then you produce two copies of long keying material and you send it off to different places and you use that and you add it to your plain text. And there's a very reasonable sense in which the systems of that kind are unbreakable. There's another very reasonable down-to-earth sense in which the most famous cryptographic failure of the 20th century is called the Venona uh, it was called the Bonona Project in the U.S. It was a failure of the Soviets to, manufa man to manage, manufacture and manage one-time material correctly that led to a lot of their traffic being read. And in brief, right, people continue. A company called Tristato 10 years ago, 15, was built on a whole proposal that involved one-time pads, one-time systems. The fact is, that strikes me as exactly the wrong thing to do. Because the fault of modern cryptography is not that we do it with small finite state automata. We understand that quite well. If instead you do it by having vast quantities of one-time key, you move the project to make it one of mass databases. And that's something we're not especially good at. End aside. Um, I said everything else is rotten. Uh, crypto implementation is, you know, somewhere from fair to dreadful in most things. Uh, when you hear about things being broken, it is in, when I say invariably, because the, uh, the implementations had failures, either failures imaginative enough, you know, far-fetched enough, you shouldn't have noticed them to start with, or just plain blunders. And the key management, in particular key production, is rather crummy. Uh, a few weeks ago, Lenstra and, uh, I want to say Haber, because the two of them have a great uh, time stamping system, is Lenstra and Hughes came out with a, and several of Lenstra students came out with a paper with, to me, of course, the charming title, uh, Ron was wrong, Whit is right. After I'd thought about it for a week, I decided that was, you know, the whole thing was a bit flaky, but the essential point, they went out and looked up thousands and thousands of keys, RSA public keys on the internet, and discovered a may, they had a rather surprising number of factors in common. And when two RSA keys have a factor in common, that just destroys both of them completely. And this turns out, in retrospect, all right, the RSA system is a little bit brittle with respect to that phenomenon. But the key thing that's wrong is that the random number production and methods in use in some things on the internet are not very good. And that's a very understandable problem. And let's hope that after all of that, it gets fixed rather quickly. 
The other thing, the security of, I think the success of cryptography is rather misleading. And so in particular, we have achieved in cryptography a very sharp separation between what is public and what is secret. And so at these sweet B algorithms, they're all public. They are, by and large, US federal standards and adopted in other standards organizations. And, of course, the keys that they use are secret. That sharp distinction in other places, and then the cryptographers go and deride any, anything less than such a sharp distinction as, as security by obscurity. I think the fact is that that sharp distinction is a great luxury. It's a remarkable accomplishment. But you cannot expect that to be a true of many security phenomena. And it is very frequently, unfortunately, true that you need to make use of much broader, uh, a much broader use of secrecy in security systems. Okay, so a managerial summation of cryptography, and after this I'm going to get off of it, is that it has two properties. One is truly wonderful. Cryptography frees you from the need to audit the path that a message has followed. Right? If you're securing a worldwide enterprise, if you encrypt all your messages, you leave the communications manager free to rent fiber, rent satellite channels, send mail, whatever might be cheapest, most reliable, quickest, whatever you want, without that having an effect on the security. That is great. The other aspect is a mixed blessing. Cryptography functions like an amplifier. Right? It amplifies the security of the keys, or the insecurity of the keys, to be the security or insecurity of gigabits of traffic. In one sense, that's a tremendous economic gain. But in some other sense, it means, well, cryptography really hasn't done anything for you. It has moved the problem to another arena. And so at the moment, it may look as though possessing a cryptographic key is what has allowed you to have access to something, to authenticate yourself to something. But in fact, the harder part of the problem is that somewhere, something had to make that decision in the sense of looking at the company you work for, you know, looking at what your clearance is, looking at what projects you're working on. Something had to make the actual decision. Cryptography doesn't do that. It just sort of conveys the decision. And it's that other part, in some sense, is the subject of computer security. Well, I said, maybe our success in cryptography is going to add for 90 years. All right. Unfortunately for that, you know, that would be comforting if computer security had come along yesterday. The trouble is, computer security came along in the 1960s. Before you had time-sharing systems, you really didn't much distinguish the security of computers from the security of server rooms. Right? I mean, it's back to the 19th century. You guard the computer, and you vet the personnel, and you lock the cards and the printouts up in safes and things like that. And that was computer security, actually, at the time I started working in 1965 at MITRE. Um, but at that same time, systems that was shared operation, multi running multi-programming, multi-processing, there was lots of jargon, in which you can get more action of a out of a computer by having multiple people working on it at once, and all of a sudden you get very nervous that down there somewhere inside where you can't see it, something is leaking that you aren't seeing. Boy, it turned out you should have been nervous. Um, and in, well, it's amazing in some sense how much hasn't changed and how much how, how we see the problem in many of the same ways, and yet have said so little problem, progress in solving it. Really, computer security has three elements. One is knowing what you want to do. That is, writing a specification for what security is. I would say that's a solidly unsolved problem. There are cases you can state it very clearly. There are lots of cases where you can't. Second is writing good code. Uh, We've made a tremendous amount of progress, actually, in writing code over my, over my career in this field. But it's clearly just vastly inadequate to what is needed. And we have things like, we have things like languages that encourage buffer overflows rather than discouraging. I mean, it's, 
the thing, number of no-brainer things you could do if you could do them. And for various reasons in that particular case, it's that you can't replace ANSI standard C or nobody will buy your C compiler. At least that's what they told me at Sun. Um, I mean, we had a C compiler. I said, well, why, don't, why are we having this problem? We don't change the language. Ah, you can't change the language. It has to conform to this, that, or the other. Our customers won't buy it. Well, the last point, the more, most interesting point is, you have to recognize that writing good code is expensive. I mean, our original vision, we had this fantastic vision back circa 1970. We were going to give full formal proofs that the code was correct. Right? So far, some people have gotten, you know, you managed to do samples and things like that. But that proved to be a factor of 100 to 1,000 more expensive than we thought it was going to be. Um, but even if you have a more conservative approach, you know, look, I, Microsoft did a whole lot of security training and so forth. That costs money. Hiring better programmers costs money. Uh, spending more time testing costs money. There are lots of ways you can improve the quality of your code. All of them cost you something. Are those the best way of spending money? So that leads you to the conclusion, well, not all your code can be your best code, but maybe your best code can be used to manage all of your code. And this is called the confinement problem. And once again, this goes back to the 70s, and the jargon was we're going to have something called the reference monitor, and the reference monitor will control all flows of data in the, in the system. This proved to be about a, as effective as telling your children whom to associate with. Um, and basically, we've diddled this notion of confinement around since then. We talk about jails and sandboxes and this, that, and the other. We've changed what the criteria are. We've relaxed them. In one sense, we relaxed them. I mean, the US DOD wanted the highest guarantees that no information was going to leak out of its secret systems. But on the other hand, it was willing to run only programs that it bought from, I don't know, US corporations or cleared programmers or something like that. And you know, if you look to sort of the Java sandbox standard, it's, well, let's go out and get this app that comes from a ratty source on the internet that we never heard of before, and we're going to run it in the sandbox, and we get useful work out of it, and it won't be able to hurt us. Well, you know, what they do is better than nothing, but not adequate for a lot of purposes. I mean, I think we had a glaring example just about a year ago. The break in to RSA that stole the keying material for the, uh, for the secure ID tokens was, according to the accounts I've read, done somebody was fooled into opening a spreadsheet attachment, which then took over his machine and compromised who knows what. Now, wait a minute, this is ludicrous. You shouldn't be able to get an email and, you know, open in an in, in alleged format and then open it within the scope of that format and combine its resources so that it can't hurt you? Well, there actually are some reasons you can't. It's because of the influence this communication has come so deeply into our modern techniques of doing everything. So we've been working on that one for 50 years, so we ought to be halfway there, right? But I think if you compare cryptography in 1965 with computer security now, you don't get such a warm feeling, particularly considering the last 20 years have been at internet speed. So where are we now? I mean, my perception, and you have a much more expert perception than I do, I expect, is that our day-to-day -day problems are nothing more than a serious nuisance. That sort of, you do better. I mean, in Microsoft's a clear example of this, right? You want business success, you do better by not demanding that everything be secure. That's expensive, you can spend your money in some other ways. From one point of view, that's a very good decision. There's a well-known sort of business case of the change in drug stores in the U.S. I apologize, I don't know about other places, but in the U.S. in the year I was a small child, drug stores were switching from a sort of a small operation that had a counter and the druggist stood behind the counter and served you things to bigger operations with all sorts of open shelves of things that you could pick. And they knew in that process, they knew it ahead of time, they experienced it, of course a lot of stuff's going to get stolen. So what? 
right? You will do things about it. You'll have bubble packaging. You'll, you know, expand the police and the shopping centers, whatever. But the key point is you're going to do more business, and the whole thing you're interested in here is the total of how much money you make. So you don't care if there's more theft as long as there's a total of more revenue. It's not clear that that analysis applies correctly to everything, but it applies to a lot of things and goes a long way, I think, toward explaining uh, the state of security. The problem is, side by side with that, is a very ill-understood danger with, in my view, the very ill-considered term, the advanced persistent threat, that nobody knows exactly who is capable of, break, you know, of, of bringing down the critical infrastructures, of damaging the big generators, of causing one-way reactions in the nuclear power plants, of disabling you know, the cars on the motorway uh, so that suddenly their brakes don't work. All sorts of <laughs> getting to your pacemakers so suddenly you, know, you think you've fallen in love because your heart's racing. Um, and that simply is simply terrifying. Now, the common wisdom is, that, well, why do we have a problem? Well, it's because defense is harder than offense. And I frankly am not clear about this point. I wonder whether we're measuring correctly. And I think there's a sort of a, a perversion built into the way things are measured. So look at a major example I would think, by and large, seen as an example of insecurity over the last few years, which is the allegation about the Bradley Manning WikiLeaks connections. Let's see how Bradley Manning is being tried for having uh, siphoned a whole bunch of stuff onto, I don't remember what it was, you know, a uh, USB stick or something like that, off of the... Uh, off of the uh, CIPRNet, the Secret Internet Router Protocol Network of DOD, and giving it to WikiLeaks, which, which then published it, or published, published lots of it. And so, well, that sounds, in one sense, that very clearly for the DOD is a big security failure. Now, it looks like I had from another point of view. Well, there were, they knew there were opponents, right? All right, so the opponents didn't succeed in breaking the high-grade crypto system. They didn't succeed in breaking the key management system. They didn't succeed in breaking TAC Lane, the piece of crypto equipment that was used for this. They had to run an agent, and for that matter, it's a walk-in agent, and they've lo lost their agent, and, and so forth. So you have to say, I think a variety of people who designed the system should say, you know, we did a pretty good job of that. We had an awful thing happen, but it's something that the opponents can't mass produce, and that's... That's, I think, a very important point. Um, so basically, when def even when defense has done its job well, it is blamed for anything other than doing it perfectly. Now look at the other side. When offense has had any success, it's credited for its success. I'm suggesting that what is, what is asymmetric here may not be the intrinsic difficulty of the problems, but the motivators and rewards for working on them. Well, one common view is that we need deterrence. I've heard people say, you know, eh, we're being attacked by the Chinese and the, they sit in their comfortable offices in Beijing and they just poke at it and poke and poke and poke and we can't, you know, they aren't going to go to jail or something if we figure out who they are. There's nothing we can do about them. And we need to, you know, put those people at risk so they can get less sleep at night or something like that. can't exactly explain it, but I don't find that that viewpoint very persuasive. I actually think that deterrence is popular for two less than entirely wholesome reasons. One is the legacy of the Cold War. Right? There was no question we did not know how to protect cities from the blasts of hydrogen bombs. Right? You had to do something. You could not build a wall around a city that would withstand the explosion of a nuclear weapon. So it wasn't that deterrence was a wonderful idea. It was merely we didn't know how to do anything else other than try to persuade people not to shoot at us. The other point is that offense is more fun than defense, and it's more profitable than defense. So, you know, that draws a constituency. Last point is that deterrence largely leads to centralization of authority. 
And that always has a constituency because there's a, a base in human beings that wants to have authority. And you can't have authority unless there's authority to be had. So anything that creates authority structures and centralizes authority always has a very significant um, constituency. Now, one of the most persuasive and disturbing ways I heard, I like better than the sort of deterrence arguments, a little more like something I said earlier, a student man named Bruce Held, who was at the time chief of counterintelligence at Sandia National Laboratories with the Nuclear Command and Control Lab. And he said, you know, if you're working defense, and you go to your boss and you say, you know, I need a million dollars next year. And your boss says, well, what could you do if, you know, we, we don't know until we have more than 800,000. What do you think you could do? Suppose you're working, quote, cyber operations. You're working offense. You go to your boss and say, you know, I need a million dollars next year. He says, well, we like what you did last year. If we gave you a million two, what could you do for us? Right? That sounds exactly right. In short, offense seems headed to win the funding war in this subject. So none do have to do whether the problem is intrinsically more difficult or less difficult. Right? And it's one of the misleading things. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that offense in in cryptography is more expensive than defense. If you look at the expenditure of things like the British building 200 bombs to attack the uh, Enigma system and so forth, the, the huge resources were spent on, on that activity. Um, intrinsically more than seems to be needed to design uh, secure systems. So to rephrase what Bruce Held said, basically any success in offense is rewarded and any failure in defense is punished. Let's rephrase maybe both of the things before. Now, one of the things people often propose is they somehow, oh, well, we need a whole new internet for the, you know, the banking, the national secrets, the critical infrastructure, whatever. Uh, I think this is dangerous nonsense. And, but I have to ask to start with, of course, you know, if this is a good idea, well, has it been done already? I mean, the US DOD has three networks called Nippernet, Sippernet, and JWIX. They're respectively unclassified, secret, and top secret. And, all right, do I doubt their isolation from the outside world and the ordinary, you know, I think the cryptography is just as good as having strung separate wires. I don't think that's the problem. But suppose they are successful. And I hear, you know, I, I don't have any inside information on the subject, but I sort of hear mixed rumor as to whether, wh how much they suffer from viruses and things like that. But to the degree, I'm kind of prepared to believe they're more secure as the classifications go up. But I think that the reasons are not very reassuring. That is to say, they're expensive and they're not scalable. The big expense there was protecting the endpoints, both in, in terms of securing buildings and in getting clearances for all the people who can touch the network. All right, so, you know, if the charges are correct, they made a mistake with Bradley Manning. But after all, they have a million employees. What do you expect? And so that, let's note that that's not something could, a mechanism. In when you're in real business, right? Sun, for example, my last real job, we had, had people from all over the world you know, they come in quickly, you need people with expertise, etc. You don't have this luxury intelligence agencies have of, of sitting around six or eight months waiting to get a clearance for somebody. Uh, UN is a wonderful example, apparently. Everybody at the UN is vetted by somebody, so it's not, you know, you don't necessarily have control of, uh, of whom the people you're working with are vetted by. That's, those are real security problems. Um, so, the, you know, they're securing the endpoints and so forth. It's, uh, it doesn't scale, and it's not clear whether it's been entirely successful in the sense, aside from this famous leak, uh, we just don't know how much they suffer from internal uh, disturbances by, by invaders. Um, what you really can't isolate is the software and the supply chain. And so if you try to imagine building a whole separate network, you're still going to be running basically the same environment. Back as late as the 70s, US Air Force tried writing its own software. 
It wasted billions of dollars and basically accomplished nothing. The, the tyranny of the mass production or something affects everything. The move towards sweet B is a perfect example. Let's not try to do just our own thing. Let's merge our activities with the rest of the world. Um, finally, most close to finally, I think security problems are dominated by scale and the issue is what scales. And I think maybe this offense-defense thing is a question of, you know, you're defending well, but now you need to scale it to a bit, something that's a million times as large, and the penetrations don't scale in the same way. Um, there's an interesting problem of patches leading to exploits. I'm sure it's familiar to, to many people here, that when Microsoft publishes a patch, instantly it is reverse-engineered long before it is installed by all the people who need it. And there's some very good reasons they don't want to install it immediately. They want to do regression testing and so forth. They don't know uh, what impact it's going to have on their systems. I understand that. But the point is there's an intrinsic mechanism there. It's a mechanism of scale. If you had a small organization, you could keep the whole patch secret or something until you got it installed and then you could publish it. Microsoft can't do that. The best it can do it publishes the patch then it could be months before people get the patch installed, whereas an attack based on study of the patch is going to be out in a day or two. Just instantly, something analogous happened to the Germans in World War II. They added a fourth rotor to the NATO, sort of fourth rotor, to the naval enigma. And of course, you know, submarines come into port, they go out and so forth, you have to be giving them keying material well ahead of time. They lacked adequate discipline, you know, I think it's something like 1st of April 43, it was supposed to go into service. None of that keying material should have been used before that, but it was used by dribs and drabs by mistake in various places, the result of which was the British knew all the wiring of these new rotors by the time they came into service, and it produced uh, relatively little disruption for that reason. It produced disruption for some other reasons. Um, there's another sort of scale phenomenon, and I was told... Moxie Marlinspike was here, and he, he taught me a wonderful thing last year. Published an article commenting on, on the fact that there are too many, he thought, he, as he saw it, there are too many CAs. I drew a slightly different conclusion from his article, uh, which was that the CAs are working for the wrong people. If the CAs ought to be working for the people who want to acquire keys rather than the people who want to purvey keys. And he had an example in there about it didn't make any sense, you know, for a U.S. CA to be signing Chinese keys for Chinese sites. I thought, well, I think it makes, what makes no sense is for a Chinese to care what a U.S. CA did. But for a U.S. organization to, you know, to, to want to, uh, to be, have some U.S. authority certify organizations, that struck me as perfectly reasonable. I've subsequently been told the accounting companies in Wall Street and so forth are doing something rather like this. So the main scale issue is the diversity of authority, and there's always a tension between producers and consumers. If you look at something, I have a very good example early on, you, know, you wonder why browsers don't seem to, you know, you suffer from this and that and the other about cookies and so forth. Well, I don't have an up-to-date economic analysis, but look at Netscape. Their real customers where they were selling server software. They gave the browser away. So why would you be surprised that the browser was fundamentally engineered for the convenience of the people, of the people at the server end? Um, I think one of the greatest challenges, and I'm not just going to mention it, is cloud computing. We have this holy grail called homomorphic encryption that could solve the problem the same way encryption we know solved the problem of radio. There's no sign at all in my mind that that's going to come along in time to deliver us from evil. And I think the impact of the cloud is going to be increase the dependence of small players on other people. It's not even clear to me whether the nation states are going to be large enough to resist it. But certainly, you know, much of the way you're dependent on going somewhere and renting a car, so you're able to get the kind of cars that local law and custom allow you to rent, uh, you're going to be having, you'll go out of business if you don't use services offered in the cloud. That's already perfectly clear with search engines and other things. So inexpensive is going to drive out secure for almost everybody. 
So look, what can I leave you with by way of grand challenges? I think there are three. We need to learn to program. Note the good side of that, if we can sell it, is that should be funded out of a much, much larger area than the security budget. Um, we need to fix the human interfaces. That's sort of a scale problem, and basically it's all incomprehensible. I know how many people, I remember Radio Perlman, who's, you know, one of the stars, was one of the stars of security at Sun, very well known. She said, oh yeah, whenever it asks her whether, whether what likes the certificate, she just clicks yes, because she can't understand any of the stuff it said. And, you know, I found exactly the same thing. I've only kind of can remember rejected one certificate in my life. I logged into the free, tried to log into the Free Software Foundation, and it warned me that the certificate, I didn't mind the self-signed certificate. What I minded was that it expired 20 minutes ago. I thought that was just too much nerve, and I went somewhere else. And finally, we need to fix the rules of liability. And that isn't easy. That isn't a matter of just, you know, passing a law saying you have strict liability for, uh, software, for software security or something of that kind. It would have to go hand in hand with the development of the technologies that allow the system producers to meet the, uh, the new standards. But I think that is, it's that kind of social action that will, will improve things. So thank you very much. I'll stop making us late.